how to do it and how I did it are not the same. I don't have to raise venture capital. I don't have to build a large team of people. I don't have to get growth at all costs. SparkToro does none of those things. Moz did all of those things. I, I feel like at some point, some very wealthy people were able to sort of convince all of us that we should be Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and that running a beautiful spa in Japan for 700 years is dumb. Last year, Moz sold for a life-changing amount of money. Not you can do nothing with the rest of your life, but kind of you can do anything with the rest of your life. One of the <laughs> one of the things that happened was I was like, Geraldine, the budget for the video game just went way up. <laughs> <laughs> On today's show, I talk startup culture and why a grow at all cost approach to business kills so many of them with the co-founder and former CEO of Moz, Rand Fishkin. People obviously know you as one of the co-founders of Moz. You're also the author of this amazing book, Lost and Founder, where you are super, super vulnerable. I can't wait to get into your story, you leaving Moz and starting your next venture, a Spark Toro, and what even that looks like, like what you chose to purposefully cast aside and say, I'm not going to do that again, and what you purposefully chose to hold on to and double down on. But to take a step back, I don't mean this as an insult, but but you don't look like, you don't sound like, you don't come across as the Silicon Valley, West Coast, Seattle tech kind of CEO. And then as we dig into your story, it's like, oh, it makes sense because that wasn't actually even you. You kind of fell into everything. Um, yeah. I, How, first off, I just want to say, I'm not sure anyone has said anything kinder about me ever. <laughs> oh, good. You, you receive it as a compliment. <laughs> oh, my God. You don't look like a West Coast tech bro. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what did I do to deserve this honor? Uh, yeah, I. It was a very accidental journey as an entrepreneur. I think this is true for for many, many founders and creators is that they they stumble into things and some of them um, plenty that I've talked to who, who did stumble and accidentally fall into their path, they feel like they have to reconceptualize their story as an intentional one because it fits better with the narrative that they think they're supposed to tell the world. Um, I think that's, that's kind of awful. I have a, I don't know, a friend who was like a, an opera singer who got a little burnt out and then started dating a woman in tech and kind of fell into the tech path and, I don't know. I love this guy, but now his story is, you know, I was always meant to be a tech entrepreneur and it's a little, you know, it's a little more a little mainstream narrative. History. Yeah. And I, I think, I think his authentic story is beautiful, but um, eh, this yeah. is, this is the way I think the we'll talk about this a ton. I'm sure Mark, but like my sense is I'm, I'm sure you've seen this too, that, that mainstream culture and that media and the, the ocean of content in which we all swim, social or otherwise, uh, nudges us to fit in in certain ways, nudges us to, to tell our story in certain ways, to find our crowd in a certain way, and then you know, figure out how we're part of that as opposed to um, the much harder thing of my journey is weird and unique. I'm weird and unique. I don't fit in with any of these crowds and I'm not going to pretend to. That's hard. It, it is hard, uh, especially when you're right. I, th I think often we search for answers in our past that hopefully point towards the future. I've done this myself. I do it more as a discovery of like, oh, I didn't even realize that stuff that I was beating myself up for wasting time on now serves me. And, and hopefully, you know, your opera singing friend who has gone into tech will find themselves maybe in 5, 10, 15, 20 years with some kind of Venn diagram overlap where suddenly yeah. all, uh, all of the, the lessons and the learning and, and maybe the discipline or, or whatever just, just finds itself in the messy soup of, our, of, of his brain just kind of coming all together. Part of what I so appreciate about you is there are these myths there are these ideas, and you just hinted a little bit about it, that, that, that we feel as, as business people, as entrepreneurs, as creatives, as founders, that we have to show up with this clean story that, that things happened for a reason. They happened efficiently. They happened quickly. There was no wasted money. There was no wasted time. There was no hard lessons learned. Look at how good we are. Hmm. And yet, your, your, your journey of building Moz was not only 
it seemed like every two or three years taking a sharp turn different directions. It not only took what seems to have been an incredibly long time because you actually lay out all the details, but, but you, you shatter a whole bunch of myths that we all kind of prop up in the entrepreneurial or business world thinking maybe unfairly so that there are these standards, there are these ideals, there are these myths that we're all supposed to live up to. And then I fear that as entrepreneurs or as creatives, when we don't live up to it, we beat ourselves up for that. What are, what are some of these standard myths that you think are just total bull? The, the, the list is innumerable, but I think uh, part of it is how you present yourself as a leader, right? So strength, confidence, um, invulnerability, a focus on logic over emotion, um, a whole bunch of sort of classic American masculine traits. All of those things are expected of leaders in not just the tech world, right? All, all sorts of worlds. And I, I think especially if you're a dude, I obviously can't speak to the the, the challenges that women experience in, in this world, but I think they're you know, even worse, and and probably many of them as a, as a result of that uh, set of expectations. But if if you are, you know, a dude like me, and what I like to say is, I, you know, if, if there's a gender spectrum, I'm sort of just to the side of masculine, like like right on the borderline, because um, I don't, I just don't have a whole lot of interest or excitement around most things that that classic masculinity um, teaches or suggests we're supposed to be and and never had those. And so when when I was trying to fill those shoes as an entrepreneur and a leader and a CEO, uh, that was very uncomfortable. and I think I think this is something that's that many people will find really hard, whether whether you're a hyper masculine dude or all the way on the other end of the spectrum or somewhere you know somewhere on a different axis, um, that living up to, an expectation that is not who you are authentically is painful and ugly, and it eventually leads to also, you know, anxiety, burnout, depression, mental health problems, emotional health and happiness problems, relationship problems, um, challenges in building a, a company culture. Just every one of those things is a is a negative result of that. And I, I wish that we embraced much more of this idea that you can be who you are and who you want to be, and you can build cultures and find your people and build your kind of organization through that, rather than there's a singular path or a common path to winning. Um, I think this is a, a fundamental challenge of kind of modern media meets modern capitalism. And I don't know how to break out of it other than folks like yourself, Mark, right? Like you bring people onto a show that people listen to and they get to hear many different stories. And, and my hope would be that creators like yourself who, who build these audiences and then broadcast and amplify to them are helping folks see that there is not one path, right? There are, there are many, many paths and I don't have to, for example, if I'm an entrepreneur in the technology space, I don't have to raise venture capital. I don't have to build a large team of people. I don't have to uh, attempt to get growth at all costs. I don't need to hit a certain uh, amount of you know, percentile growth or dollars in growth and revenue. I don't have to only pay back my investors in through uh, um, you know, returns in an exit or an IPO. We can talk about this later, but like Spark Toro does none of those things. Moz did all of those things, and and so I can kind of hopefully illuminate another path for folks, and and I hope many of your other guests do the same. Well, it's funny because when I started my agency in two thousand six, and I would say for the first eight or maybe nine years, let's say half of that time, people would ask me how I did it, and I would prescribe for them exactly how to do it. And then I hit a point where I realized, oh, uh, I only know how to build a company my way. <laughs> how to do it and how I did it are not the same. Yeah. Like I love giving marriage advice yeah. up until again a few years ago. And then I realized I'm only really good at being married to my wife. Uh, I'm not really good at being married to anyone else. So 
uh, suddenly though, but, but it's almost scary. It, it's freeing and terrifying because once you realize that there is no path other than the one that allows you to continue to move forward, it's very freeing. Yeah. And when there's no path other than the one that works for you, suddenly it's completely terrifying because all of, again, the certainty that we're chasing or the things that we want, when I say, just, Rand, just, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And you go, I, well, you know, try and see. And it's like, I don't want that answer. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to think of a lot of um, complex ideas as existing on a spectrum, right? And, and one of those ideas is you have to figure out everything for yourself there is no path, you're on your own. And, and at the other side is, there is one path, everyone should do it, this is the absolute best way. And I feel like in the center of that is the, is the truth, which is there are many paths that can work and you can be inspired by and learn from other people who have followed those many paths and choose the one or ones for you and, and construct from those experiences and your own creativity, the way that you wanna do things. What's remarkable about Rand's story is how ridiculously humble Maz's start really was. 20 or so years ago, it was just a web design company. He started with his mom. At one point, they were facing so much debt and bankruptcy, they had to sneak their computers out of their offices because they were about to be seized. And so it's really easy to think of, you know, the 30, the 40, the $50 million company that Maz became. You can think about the venture capital and the tech startup culture and, and all of, you know, riding high. You can think of it as this path that he took where Rand started here and he got to here and it was like a straight shot up. And that's just not the case. And so what I love so much about Rand is how painfully honest and revealing he actually is. And I think that's especially illustrated in the story he shares when Moz was at a point that they had this amazing product. They had year over year growth, a great product, a great team, great customers. But because they were chasing further growth, they need they wanted growth fast. They introduced a second product, and a third product. And they started acquiring other companies and everything seemed good until it wasn't. They're looking back quarters later, years later, and they realize that all of this growth, all of this chasing growth of the second, the third product, the acquisitions and what have you actually cost them the growth on their primary product, it actually cost them the relationship with the customers they had so carefully nurtured. And it was all turned out to be a big distraction and it hurt the company. I don't hear other entrepreneurs, other business leaders at this level, sharing these types of stories, talking about these types of challenges. Yeah, it doesn't serve them, right? So I think that this is, this is one of the biggest problems with uh, storytelling in general is that almost everyone who has a story to tell tells that story because it will help them accomplish something, right? It'll position them with an audience somehow, or it'll help their marketing. It'll help them, whatever, raise money next time or, you know, get, get, um, more growth, more value. And one of the things that I really wanted to do with Lost and Founder, and this is why the stories in there are, um, a little more brutally honest than just transparent is, tell stories that don't make us look good, right? And what <laughs> did that accomplish that, for you though? You just said, you know, we all, yes. we all do this to accomplish something. What was, what, how did this accomplish something for you then? Yeah, because uh, my goal is not to accomplish something for me, it's to accomplish something for the reader, right? The, the goal is serve the reader. If that comes back to me somehow, great. If, if it doesn't, that's fine too. It's really interesting. I was, I was talking to uh, someone the other day about this concept of enough. Like, do you have enough? Are you enough? Have you done enough? And I think only one of those three is, is generally true for me, which is that I have enough. Like I, I am going to keep working. I'm gonna, I, I am still participating in the capitalist economy and I like creating things and I want to make you know, my, my co-founder and, and um, Amanda, our only uh, employee team member, I want to do right by them. I want to do right by our investors. But I personally, from a financial raw financial standpoint, I could probably stop if I needed to, right? Like I could coast. Uh, but I don't believe that I am enough. 
I don't think that growth path will ever stop. And I don't think that I've done enough in terms of helping other people. And so that's what Lost and Founder is, right? It's um, it's going along that journey, not along the how do I get more journey. What was the um, reception? Because what what I what I actually really love about this conversation is we're a few years away f- from the book being released. Yeah. Right? Like four yeah. or five years ago, it was released. And and often when I'm speaking to authors, it's either pre-release or just coming out. But but we have this amazing opportunity now to not only, for, for me at least, and, and anyone who's read it, to be able to get a sense of where that book, that chapter of your life ended, but then what happened next. Yeah. Um, but how how was it? How was it received? Of course, you're going to have the camp of people who are like, "Oh, you know, you're so great and you're vulnerable and all of that positive stuff." Let's let's ignore that positive stuff. <laughs> what backlash did you get from being this raw? Yeah. Uh, I mean, one. I think one of my favorite things from a. Um, a reviewer, someone who who read it in the tech world that I know, um, was uh, Rand. After this book, you will never be able to raise money again. I, I had that thought. I had yeah, that thought. Only I, thought I bet like, you did. Like, how is this guy going to continue to lead a team? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, and and the you know that was slightly narrow thinking because I, this person was correct in that I don't think any venture investor. Um, Certainly not ones with with reputations and um, you know deep networks would would put money into a company that I started and ran. Uh, however, and I think they'd be wise not to. I, we're, I'm not a match for that environment and that structure, and we, we can talk about all the problems of it if if that's of interest to your audience. But what I think that, that this person probably did not consider is that there are lots of people, plenty of them, who don't love the venture model and idea and might still be looking for investments to make in the startup and tech world that don't fit the parameters of classic venture. And and what we did with SparkToro was design a different structure to be able to raise money from individuals. A a lot of folks like yourself, actually, Mark, agency founders are like half of our investors in uh, in SparkToro. Um, I was going to say, too, uh, one of the other quite negative things that came from the book. So this is a little bit inside baseball, but um, the leadership team at Moz um, and the board of directors to a slightly lesser extent was very nervous about the contents of the book, like deeply, deeply nervous. So for for folks who don't know, I had uh, started Moz with my mom in in 2001 and then been CEO from 07 to 14. And that, that was the time that it sort of transitioned from an agency to a software business. Um, and then grew to you know thirty plus million in revenue and raised a bunch of money and all that kind of stuff. And and then I stepped down as CEO during a bout of with with depression, promoted my chief operating officer to the CEO role, and stayed at the company for four years, uh, which in, on reflection was probably a mistake. Um, and then you know left, started SparkToro, but during those four years, those that, that end period, that's when I was writing Lost and Founder. And it was it was published a few months after I left the company. You know, reality was that, you know, the CEO and the the board were just really scared, I don't know, yeah. frustrated, upset by the contents of the book because it is so relatively revealing. Yeah, yeah. Revealing and transparent. And not in a way, right? It it very much um takes this approach of these are the mistakes that I made that we made, and I hope that you don't have to make them too, right? Like we are all going to make mistakes as as founders and creators and entrepreneurs. But my, my hope is that if, if you read this book, you'll at least avoid these specific pain points, and that will make that will make it almost worthwhile that that we had to go through them, right? Yeah. I think that's another part of it. Is I don't want the the the, the terrible dumb decisions and choices that I made to be things that other people fall into, like let them mean something by, by helping others. So, you know, there was a, there was a legal fight. There was a lawyers on both sides. I had to hire attorneys and um, they negotiated, you know, who had visibility penguin random house, the publisher of lost and founder was was like, no, you will not give any edit permissions to anyone. (laughs) Like hell no. Right. They, they, they eventually agreed to have, I think there was two chapters where the, um, the board and the leadership team got to read them before publication, but not comment on or, or change anything 
just they got to read them um but nasty yeah that, yeah it, it was it was a really tough time i mean one of the challenges right was that that Moz um starting about maybe a year after i stepped down right the, the growth rate was falling you know the company's still growing but just not as fast and then eventually it kind of plateaued right around 50 million dollars in revenue and um yep very frustrating kind of stuck in the middle investment do you look back on that time as as obviously all over the place up down you know you're you're leaving the company that you founded uh you're transitioning you're writing this book but do you look back at the courage that you kind of instilled in yourself or, or the the ability for you to fight to to share your story to be honest i think i'm someone who by default is to want to overshare um and to overshare the the painful ugly parts that other people don't talk about um but i will say there there is a beautiful freedom and confidence that comes from uh the cathartic process of writing your journey down right and sharing that with other people um and then finding that it resonates with some folks even if it turns others off i think um i, I think that's kind of a beautiful thing if you're watching this and you're at the point in your life where you're transitioning from one thing to the next and you feel like that last thing failed it's hard not to have that past failure kill your confidence and i say failure in air, air quotes here right because i i've seen people do this with relationships you know their marriage comes to an end and they say it failed and then they write off the whole thing as a failure but we know that's not true. We know that's not the case. You had this amazing thing and it came to an end. Even if that end was terrible, it doesn't change that you once had something really special and amazing. Would it have been better for Rand if he walked away from Oz selling it, having a huge success, a bag of cash as he turns to his next thing? Of course. But what I so love about his raw story, the hard lessons he shares in his books, and, and ultimately, what I draw a lot of hope from is that there's life after the failure. There's life after the ride up, after the ride down, and after the crash. I left Moz February 28th of 2018, and I started Spark Toro March 1st of that same year. Um, so gave myself like a whole 12 hours off. Uh, and, and a big reason for that is I needed health insurance and a salary super fast like re real real quick i got a severance package from moz but basically you know i, I knew what the startup path was going to be like and and i needed to get on top of that right away geraldine and i were pretty my, my wife and i were pretty scared about um, See, and this would mortgage. surprise this would surprise anyone to say i mean you earlier said that you grew the company to 30 million you say now it's kind of petered out maybe at 50 million like we're talking about huge numbers you're talking about selling yeah. to hubspot 200 like all of this stuff and then to, to find out that you dedicated 20 years of your life to build to build an eight-figure company and to pour all of your time all of your effort all of your heart into this thing and the day that you, the day after you leave you need to you need the next thing because you got to pay the mortgage i mean yeah that, well, that is revealing I mean, yeah the I, the reality is right that essentially you know all my net worth right was tied up in the in the stock of the company and um in this weird way like the board of directors doesn't doesn't want to pay you market rate they want to pay you kind of less than market rate because you own so much stock and so like kind of there's this weird i don't know exactly how to describe it but the the basic story is i i never made as much as i would have you know as a low-level manager at microsoft right um so you know like i thought i was doing great at 120k a year um in seattle and and uh like we said before, I was not, you know, broke. We we had um, six figures of savings in the bank, like, but we had also bought an expensive house. You know, housing in Seattle is very expensive. We had an expensive mortgage. We had um, Geraldine's mom to help out, and and um, my grandparents on my dad's side, and just lots of lots of financial stress. So. Uh, I leave the company, I write this blog post, my last day at Moz, my first day at SparkToro. 
Um, and that, um, that post and over the next two weeks, you know, on, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, in the comments, which you can, you can still go see, there were, uh, literally a combined, you know, 10,000 plus messages from people all over the world saying not just kind things like incredibly amazing things, you know, Rand, you helped me you know, a break out of debt. You helped, you know, I dropped out of college or I was never able to go to college, but I was able to get this job at an agency because I watched Whiteboard Friday and you taught me SEO and like that changed my life. I met you at a conference in 2007 and you introduced me to my future boss. And I got married because I went to this MozCon event and we met and I met my significant other. I, I worked at Moz for a couple of years and I met my spouse. Like just the number of stories was insane and overwhelming. And you know, I was like crying with gratitude at my desk every day, just reading through all this stuff. It was beautiful. And, and it gave me this sense of like, oh, maybe this company and this journey was not a failure. Maybe there are things that are more important than making millions of dollars from your business. Maybe the few, you know, the handful of friendships and, and negative experiences that you know, and relationships that were lost are nothing compared to the incredible quantity of beautiful relationships that were built. And I just need to take a step back and have some gratitude and reflect on the whole picture and not just the bad stuff. Um, that was, just, damn, that, that was a great, a great, great experience. And if I think about what I want SparkTora to be like, I hope that when, whenever this company winds down or I leave it or, you know, whatever, that there'll be one tenth as many people saying this business helped them, you know, half as much. The truth is uh, that you know, if, if if I sit down with someone often at dinner, I like to I like to interview people. <laughs> I mean, that's why that's why <laughs> at I dinner at, at dinner, yeah, yeah. People people either like it or they think I'm grilling them. So I've learned how to not you know intimidate people too much. But if I ask a couple how they met, I'd say half the time people start with it's kind of a funny story. <laughs> And I love that it's kind of a funny story yeah. because life is, is nothing but it's kind of a funny story if you open yourself up to them. The fact that, you know, this couple and they go, they, they might say something like, um, well, you know what, actually we were in college and I was friends with his friend's friend and we were at this thing and then we didn't talk to each other for two years. And you're like, wow, that's so amazing. That's so beautiful. I, Mark, I love that. Mark, that's literally that. the story of how Geraldine and I met. <laughs> That's exactly it. I like, nailed it. I think all I you think have to I, add is, and then we ran into each other on a bus after a Weezer concert, and that's uh, that's the story. Uh, I was just listening to the sweater song this morning, but um, uh, Blue Album all the way. Uh, but but I don't think other areas of our lives we we either allow for that kind of a funny story looking forward, future casting, yeah. or even in the past look at these things as well. It's, it's kind of a funny story, actually, how that happened. And, and I'm, I'm almost a little obsessed with trying to find more of these things. And so as you move from Moz to SparkToro, I'm curious how fear of failure, fear of making the same mistakes, fear of realizing that um, you can't run away from yourself, how do you transition from one company to the next thing in your life without bringing all of that fear with you and having it slow you down? Um, for me, I brought all that fear with me to the design of the business, right? So essentially, I... Do you want to engineer the new business in such a way as to actually overcome some of these potential challenges that you had to face in the past? And, and, and not even overcome, but give myself pathways to never have to deal with them. Oh, that sounds awesome. <laughs> right? How so, do you do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you some examples. So one of the things that I never loved doing was managing people. So I knew that in this new business, I wanted to design a company where people management was not important to the growth of the business, which means designing a company that requires a, a very small team and hiring people who are completely self-motivated and need no management and don't really like management and um, are just great 
personal and professional fits for what Casey and I, my, my co-founder and I are building. And we're extremely hands-off. It means having a virtually no meeting culture. So Casey and Amanda and I have had, I don't know, one meeting every like two months, something like that, right? We, we almost, never, we, we email, right? We chat on, you know, a uh, uh, Google chat or whatever. Sometimes mostly it's about, I don't know, BS, you know, just like fun stuff. Um, and we have projects that we try to get done, but we have very few deadlines. Um, we also have a structure that allows for essentially fully remote work because I knew that an office environment was not something that I was great at building and didn't love the office culture. And I, um, I like the independence of being able to work from home. I love deep work. So, you know, finding and engineering all these kinds of things. I, I knew that I did not want to grow a business at all costs and, and focus on, you know, a high growth rate or set a bar for myself where I would not be successful if the business reached three to five million dollars in revenue. It would only be a success if it reached, you know, 100, 200 plus, which, which is what a venture backed business really is. And so I designed a funding structure that allowed us to be successful at two million. Four, 10, 15, any number really above like two is a is a, a smashing success for us and for our investors, which, which is incredible, right? Like who knew you could you could do that? But if if you structure, we, we can talk about the details if you want, but um folks can also just Google Spark Toro funding. We open sourced our funding docs so anybody can use them. Um so all, all these sort of designy things come from a place of fear and uncertainty. Like I I'm scared that I would not be able to build a business the way I built Moz successfully. So let me engineer a different kind of metric for what success means. And then I will have a lot more confidence that I that I can do that. Is, you know, I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. I don't know if I believe this statement at all, but I but I have to ask, does that not then remove the ambition? ambition, the sense of accomplishment, the drive, the push. It sounds like you're engineering a business within your comfort zone as opposed yeah, to, to totally. outside of it. Yeah. So I, I think this goes fundamentally back to the, what is life about, right? Can your ambition only exist in a dollar quantity of the business that you build, or are there other ways to be an ambitious person? Um, and is ambition a good thing? <laughs> right? So like let's let's question a whole bunch of assumptions um, in there as opposed to just taking it as gospel that growth is good, that, amount of dollars that your business produces is the is the greatest you know marker of of success and accomplishment and that success and accomplishment should be the goal of every human being's life um and and I don't think any of those are true but let, let's dig a little deeper into this let's let's maybe uh bat this around a bit so let's let's remove um financial growth from the picture uh it sounds like you've constructed a lifestyle business and and lots of people do that and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that of course uh, but see, I mean, I, I'm going to stop you right there. You hate that. I think, term. I, I think when you a when you use that term, it is a pejorative. Like it's okay. used pejoratively to insult entrepreneurs who are not pursuing growth at all cost businesses, which uh, is whatever. No, no, it no. Is, it, you know? it, it, it it does feel that way to me because even as and, I say it, it it I'm applying a clear bias. Against, yeah, you, like, well, you it's have not a real judgment. business. Yeah, there's know? like there's like judgment around it. Yeah, and I actually think that we should all be judging the other ones. I think we should be judging growth at all cost businesses because those are clearly the ones that are unraveling the fabric of so many good things about the world um, from, you know, whatever climate issues to political issues to social connection issues. I think the, the growth at all cost businesses are, um, really, really terrible for the world and for humanity. And I think that small businesses and businesses that focus on kind of being profitable and serving their customers and their employees, those businesses are beautiful and they're the best parts of capitalism. So <laughs> I, I feel like at some point, some very wealthy people were able to sort of convince all of us that we should be Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and that, you know, whatever, running a 
a beautiful spa in Japan for 700 years is dumb. Right. And I don't even run that type of business, although I've always wanted growth. I've wanted growth because of status and, and I've been able to unpack some of those things for myself. But, yeah, but yes. even if we, if, if we remove the financial growth at all costs from this though, what fuels your growth? Because for me, I use my my business, I use my projects as uh, I use my health. I use like all, all all of these things around me. I use them to try and move the kick, you know, grow, become wiser, become smarter, um, become more fit, become more healthy. Like like I I don't want to stay still or, or stagnate. So what drives in your life this feeling of growth? Then yeah, um, so. When it comes to Spark Toro specifically, um, there is some amount of uh, sort of customer and financial growth that we do want to achieve to sort of meet our, our minimum bar and requirement. And I expect we will still pursue some growth after that. It's not like we're going to, oh, well, we hit $2 million in annual revenue. Let's not take any more customers. <laughs> no, <laughs> right? <We're, laughs> that's not going to be it either. Um, but uh, in terms of personal life satisfaction and, and happiness and personal growth, right? Because we we talked about that concept of enough and like being enough. And I I don't think I'll ever feel like I am enough. And that comes down to greater self-awareness, um, greater investment in relationships with other people, right? So building new friendships, uh, growing friendships that that we that we have uh, and deepening those connections, um, hopefully being a better husband tomorrow than I was yesterday. Um, hopefully living up to some of the, uh, I've been doing this recently, which is a, a strange, um, strange thing, but I, a really wonderful thing. I can't recommend it enough, which is, um, living up to some of my childhood promises and dreams to myself. Oh, right? what does that look like? Yeah. I, so I assume, I, I assume that most people have these, right. That when they were kids, yeah. they had this, like, I want to be X or I want to do X or I love Y. Um, and I loved as a kid, I, I was super obsessed with, uh, amphibians, uh, frogs specifically that's all my reports, you know, all my book reports and all my like school reports were always about frogs. My teachers were like, yeah, here's, here's Rand. He's got another book report about frogs. <laughs> um, and this January, uh, Geraldine and I, and some friends went down to Costa Rica. I've never been to Central America or even Mexico before, but Went down to Central America, no work agenda there. I mean, we I, I worked remotely while I was there, did but you, did you go frog hunting? Yes. <laughs> was so great, Mark. Oh my God. And I had the, you know, you have this moment where I, I I saw a little blue jeans frog for the first time, you know, in my whole life. And I'm I'm 42. And I'm just thinking of that like little nine-year-old boy who I am making him so proud and happy right now. Uh, that's not the only thing though. I also, uh, this is, this is during quarantine, I started designing a video game because I had had this, you know, I loved video games as a kid. I, I even loved them as an adult. Um, I didn't play them much during my Moz years, but I got a little back into them and I was like, I can do this. I want to make a video game. Um, and then last year, we haven't talked about this yet, but, uh, last year, Moz sold a private equity firm bought it. Um, and it was for a life changing amount of money. Um, like not certainly not, um, you can do nothing with the rest of your life, but kind of, you can do anything with the rest of your life. Uh, and one of the, <laughs> one of the things that happened was I was like, Geraldine, the budget for the video game just went way up. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so we, you know, I, I went out and sort of networked with some friends who are in tech world, who are in the video game space. And I got introductions to a bunch of studios and we got bids and pitches and started working with a game studio down in Los Angeles called Akupara games, who's produced a bunch of great indie games. Uh, and we are now, um, every week we have a, you know, a weekly call. Geraldine is, is, is writing the game. She's doing all the, um, all the narrative and dialogue and and i'm sort of the creative director and we have a game designer who's in uh, a french guy in romania who works at ubisoft and we've got a, a team of artists and programmers and project manager and you know we're in slack every day on it 
so now this indie video game is being made and yeah i feel like 10 year old me once again would be so proud so excited by these you know by these like lived up to promises of of your youth i love that so much what a what a beautiful story and i mean you're in a position in your life where you can do that yeah but part of me wonders if you haven't if, if you shouldn't have done some of these things earlier <laughs> <laughs> you no i mean you're you're 100 percent right there and, and the only reason when I say I started, that is because I don't yeah. want someone listening to go, well, it's, it's great for someone who just had a life-changing amount of money you know, well, given to them through the exit of a company. But the, but the point is, truthfully, it, you could have done some of these things earlier. You know, the, what the trip to I, Costa Rica I was like uh, the Alaska Airlines round trip tickets were like 400 bucks. They had like a super sale, right? It was yeah. very inexpensive to go yeah. there. I, I could have done that years and years ago. I started doing the video game with no no budget. Right. It was just like me. And let me see if I can find a programmer who wants to work with me on it. We'll like take a cut and maybe, you know, like pay this person like a couple grand a month or or learn to program myself. Right. Like I downloaded Unity and started playing around in it. And you like you can do stuff in the game engine. But it was it was one of those things that that I do have that that kind of regret of, gosh, there is there's nothing stopping me, was nothing stopping me except my own feeling that I was supposed to do nothing but work on Moz for 17 years, right? Like yeah. anytime I did anything else, I felt guilty about it. I, I, can, re I can relate to that because I've, I've learned in recent years that um, I have ADHD, which isn't anything <laughs> uh, special for an entrepreneur. Um, I have GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, maybe also not that special um, for, for entrepreneurs, but I understand that guilt because anything aside from the thing that I felt I should be doing felt like a distraction. Yeah, and I did not want to be distracted because I know how easily distracted I am. Um, I didn't want, uh, you know, organizational whiplash, and I didn't want to bounce from thing to thing. And I never wanted, you know, a theme in my life is I've always felt like I've I've um, touched greatness, but never spent enough time on anything to make it great. If you mm -hmm. know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and and so part of what I'm doing at this point in my life, uh, I'm just a few years younger than you, and and I love your stories because it reminds me that. We cannot wait. We can't wait for retirement. We can't wait for an exit. We can't wait. We can't, we can't just grind through the things we have to do and then find ourselves 10 years, 15 years, 17 years, 20 years later going, hey, remember when I was a kid and I really loved that thing and it lit me up and it brings me joy again now? Uh, I mean, we can't wait for the midlife crisis or we shouldn't, I should say, wait for the midlife crisis to start reintroducing some of these things that we do for ourselves. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more and... It's a tragedy that the professional world has convinced us that our exclusive life focus and value for most of the decades of the of the most productive and capable parts of our lives are supposed to be dedicated to exclusively work. I, I do feel like, Mark, I don't know if you get this sense, but I do feel like there's a shift in sentiment around this and people that are 10, 15, 20 years younger than you and I don't buy into it, right? Uh, that that they they're listening to this and they're like, yeah, dummies, no yeah. kidding. <laughs> well, uh, I'm I'm the father of four. My oldest is 15. Uh, we're going for a walk yesterday. She's in grade uh, 10, so um, I guess that makes her a sophomore in America. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're Canadians, so we we just call them grades up here. We don't we don't yeah. have all those names. But I, as soon as you say grade 10, I'm like. Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's in grade 10. And so, so she's two years away from, from graduating high school. And we're having a conversation about university or about college. And, and I just made it clear to her. I said, I said, if you know what you want to do, then we pursue that. If you don't know what you want to do, then you stop and you take a few years off. And, and she's like, yeah, but yeah, but like, just like this, this, this weird baby boomer mentality that has somehow filtered that is still in our school system that is yeah. still out there in the system that not only has gen x been questioning for a long time i'm a, a really kind of early millennial um i don't i don't like she's a z and so it's like i could see how uncomfortable this out of date thought process was making her and the stress was putting on her and i was like you're you're 15. You're you're 15. Like like by the time you graduate you'll be 18. If you don't know what you want to do for now, then you stop and you just explore some things. Like it, it like a year or two years 
or in the case of me building my agency or the case of you building your a Moz even 20 years, 17 years, whatever it was, when, when you are 60 or 70 or 80 and you're looking back, that's still just a chapter of your life. There's so much ahead of us, right? Yeah. I think one of the places, this is, this is like in a weird contrast, but one of the places that I have a lot of fear in my life, Mark, is what if I never do anything as meaningful or impactful as Moz again? Oh, <laughs> and that just hit me in my heart right there. Oh, gosh. I, right? Yeah. And... I'm trying to be okay with that. I'm trying to basically say, is my goal to make something where that many people sort of know about it and, and have heard of it and whatever, had some um, interaction with it, maybe got some value from it, or is my goal to do things that make me proud and excited and let me live the life that I want to live? And, and that's a better goal. And so I'm like, I'm constantly fighting against that old... Like, oh, but what if Spark Toro doesn't have the same impact on the marketing universe that Moz had? Be like, take a chill pill, man. Like, it's fine. <laughs> That's okay. Do you, think, do you think you might find yourself on a third chapter where where you seek the the growth, the impact, the exposure, the size of Moz with the um, what I would call this kind of Zen um, attitude towards Spark Toro, and suddenly yeah. you've now found a, a third path where it's just like, oh. I've now learned some more lessons on how I can get that th those things that I want. In my hope for the future, what it is is Spark Toro doesn't necessarily ever get to the size or or kind of you know whatever impact, broad impact that Moz had, but it is beloved by its customers and community, and it is very positively impactful to its team and investors, and maybe that you know things like this video game do quite well, right? Like I, I hope I hope that this video game, when it comes out, I really do. I hope that it sells a million copies. I hope that a million people play this game and fall in love with it and are like, oh my God, this is this is really fun. And I love the you know mechanics and I love the story and I love the fun that I have from it. And it, you know, lets me explore this this universe that I never thought about before. Um, just like video games did for us when we were kids. I, I think that those can have a beautiful impact. And then that maybe I'm able to write another book, a sequel to Lost and Founder that opens up this kind of weird chill work, you know, live up to promises to your young self, um, be more creative and artistic, worry less about economic impact and making billionaires richer <laughs> and and that and that uh that is what you know my my sort of second and third chapter look like and reflecting back on my life in 20 or 30 years i can say well you know that moz thing i kind of became pretty well known for that but these other things were impactful in these ways that i'm i'm really proud of and, and happy about so for you, I love I love closing with this question because I think it just puts such a fine point on things and often it reveals things we hadn't even spoken about. But for you at this point in your life, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Am I a better Rand than I was the day before, the week before, the month before? And that's measured through uh, the impact that I have personally on the personal relationships that I have, friends, family, my, my, my wife. Um, am I... Uh, contributing more to the world in a positive way, in, in a way that of things that I want to see more of in the future? Um, and am I uh, growing as a human being? Like I know more about myself. I know more about the world. I am more empathetic to people with different thoughts and experiences. That's, that, that's really big for me. And I think it's also for me that projects that I'm involved in are making progress. I can't get away from that yet. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still addicted to that progress. Like the video game has to be doing well, and Spark Toro has to be making progress. And I'm running an event for indie founders in in Italy in a few months, and like I have to be making progress on that. And, you know, it, all those other things. Rand will never get away from still being that guy who wants to make things. Right? I know, I know. This is what creators do. They create, and that's yeah. okay, right?